Hello everyone and welcome back to GoTo Unscripted. My name is James Lewis and I'll be talking today, I'll be in conversation with Richard Feldman. Welcome Richard. Uh, I, I think we're just going to explore some ideas around things like language design because Richard will introduce himself but in a moment but is the creator of the programming language Rock uh, and the author of the wildly successful, I'm told he paid me to say that, Elm in Action. <laughs> um, but so yeah, so we'll, we'll just have a conversation about some about languages and uh, programming in general I guess. Uh, but welcome, Richard. Maybe you could introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks. I mean, yeah, I uh, uh, created the Rock Programming Language, uh, which is still kind of a work in progress. Uh, but I um, uh, wrote the book Elm in Action, uh, and I also spent a lot of time with Rust. And uh, later in the conference, somebody talking about uh, Rust and Zig, and uh, sort of together. Um, but uh, yeah, very interested in language design. You were, you were telling earlier before the cameras were rolling about, uh, you were there when, when Rich Hickey announced Clojure uh, at, the, at the conference. I was, I was at uh, Yaru, I think it was still Yaru at the time um, in, uh, in August in Denmark. And yeah, Rich turned up and sort of blew everyone away with this, with this announcement of, uh, of, of, of Clojure. And obviously it's been uh, pretty successful yeah. since. I mean, I've, I've, we've had many projects in ThoughtWorks that have, have used Clojure over the years and I know there's a um, there's a consultancy Juxt in London that is very su successful with with as, as a pure closure consultancy actually in, in the fintech mainly in the fintech industry. What do you think actually? I mean, I'd be interested to get your take on that. Do you think there are different domains where different languages are more or less suited? Well, there certainly seems to be an element of suitability, but there also seems to be an element of just sort of cultural momentum. Like something will get traction in a particular domain. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, like especially well suited for it, but then it just sort of perpetuates. So the example that comes immediately to mm. mind is Rails and Ruby. Right. I yep. mean, if you're to zoom out and say, you know, aliens land and they're going to pick which of the languages, so the programming languages are going to become really big in web development. I don't know why anyone would say, well, it's going to be the one created by the Japanese guy that's only big in Japan right now. <laughs> that's the tagline is let's, let's make programming fun. Right. That's what's going to be used widely in industry, you know, and blow up in the next 10 years. I don't think anyone would have predicted that. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily just about, you know, like how well suited it is. It's like the perfect fit mm. as much as it is like, well, you know, one person like DHH made Rails. Uh, that, that really resonated with a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and because Ruby was the language that he chose to make that in, mm. um, you know, could have made it in Python. And he would probably say nothing else but Ruby would have inspired me to make Rails. Um, but, uh, but I think you could pretty easily make the case that someone could have made yeah. something that was as successful as Rails in a different language. Um, I think you mentioned Python. That's super interesting because I remember when Rails was massively taken off, yeah. and in Forks North America in particular, and in India, Rails became a huge thing. I mean, yeah. our founder at the time he he was very taken with it, and was there were some very persuasive people who were talking about it. Obi Fernandez, for example, um, and it seemed that we we suddenly had a load of projects in North America and in India using using Rails, and we still do actually. I think the, the world's largest Rails project was a ThoughtWorks project in, in in Atlantic City, maybe. Really? But the weird thing is, it didn't didn't spread to the rest of uh, of of the countries that we're present in. So huh. the UK was still and remains still very much a Python shop. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's it's not just a, a domain specific application. It's also there's also, there's also like a geographical thing going on? Well, I, I think you could generalize that to culture. Mm. It's like there, there's certain pockets of culture that might be geographic or might be just mm. other things uh, that, that contribute to those things. There's, I, I've spent a, an increasing amount of time over my career like learning about like why things get adopted and yeah. why they don't. And the more I learn about it, the more reasons I discover. And it <laughs> seems like there's just an, an inordinate amount of variables. And as programmers, we like to look for simple solutions and simple explanations mm. for things. But uh, much like with, I, I would say another thing that has been true uh, where I, the more I get into it, the more variables I discover has been like performance optimization, right. where like when I was in school, you know, it, all the focus was on big O notation and like, uh, what's the asymptotic complexity of this algorithm and stuff like that. And now I'm like, that's like the, this much of it. <laughs> this is the, you know, the tip of an extremely large iceberg. Um, and uh, all the stuff I just had no idea about. And it, similarly with adoption of languages or technologies in general, it's mm. like, you know, I, I would have thought, you know, early on, it's like, oh, well, people use that because that's the best thing for it. What, what else is there? Mm. And it's all these cultural and, you know, all these <laughs> timing <laughs> factors that, yeah, that I mean, come into it. I remember, think, I remember doing a, a thing with one of my colleagues about, you know, adopt, programming language adoption. And certainly it was as much about culture availability as, as yeah. um as anything else, it seemed, you know, you, you, are you better off picking something that we, where you know there's a lot of people out there who are going to, you can just hire for it? Yeah, yeah. Or 
another example would be a counter example. You know, we had uh, a, a publishing client who deliberately chose Scala because it meant that they could offer a really fun or more potentially more fun program, you know, environment for developers to come in because they couldn't pay the same rates as the banks. Yeah. You know, so there's this almost like trade off is do you offer this like more interesting, exciting environment versus, okay, just you know, whatever it is. Thousand euros a day for just a, a standard job for developer in a bank. You know? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's an underrated trade off. Is that um, if you're a company and you're you're considering a novel technology, and I've, I've talked about this before in other mm -hmm. settings, but um, I mean this is something like uh, you know my, my previous job and my current job, we uh, both have used Elm on the front end as like the entire front end, yeah. not just like a little part of it. Um, and really embracing that means that you know you, you get uh, you, you get to be very selective about who you hire. Like we just filled a front end role and uh, the recruiter was talking to me about, yeah, we you know, hired this guy and it was really close. We had to decide between him and like, you know, a couple of other people who, who really wanted this role. And, you know, usually it's the other way around where yeah. employers are like, I just want to find anybody who can fit this description that actually meets our criteria and it's really hard to find people. But, um, but you flip the script when, yeah. you're, when you're offering a technology that people want to use, but that not a lot of employers are using. Yeah. Okay. And that's almost... Um, sort of like a, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that if enough employers do that, then it, it flips back around. <laughs> but then by, by then it's mainstream. So mm. then it's not notable anymore. And, and now you're, you are saying, oh, well, I can just find lots of people to do it because it's become mainstream. But I think most people are aware of that side of the dynamic, mm. but they're not familiar with what happens before a language gets mainstream and what the dynamics like over there. Yeah, did, 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 I guess the big question is, did, did the person you hire have 25 years of Elm experience? <laughs> Let's see, I almost created in 2011, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Which I guess it comes to Elm, I'm going to put my, you know, throw my hands up and uh, profess to not generally being any good at all at front-end software that's, development. That's fine. It's not something I've done in my career, to be honest. Any front-end that I program tends to look like a bad implementation of Excel. You know, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Well, Excel not an, easy, <laughs> not an easy thing to implement, so, you know. <laughs> well, that, well, funnily enough, coming back to Ruby, uh, is a, uh, the creative aspect, Nicholas Nielsen, he showed me a, an implementation of a spreadsheet written entirely in the constant missing Method. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> you, you, know, you think about uh, how many spreadsheets you yeah. have, you're addressing the, you know, by, by capital letter first. Right. And if, if you didn't have that defined as a... As a as, oh, that's as hilarious. Say, wow. it, and you could do all the calculation in constant miss. Anyway, that's by the by. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, have you been surprised at the adoption of Elm and how successful it's been? Hmm. Uh, yes, but maybe not in the way you might guess. Hmm. So I would have thought that it would have been sort of all or nothing. I would have thought that either a language like Elm would just take over the world mm -hmm. or it would just peter out into non-existence and people would you know, walk away from it. Because I've seen that happen with you know, various different yeah. languages. Like, they, like TypeScript would be an example of taking over the world yeah. uh, that's, that's happening right now. Um, and then CoffeeScript would be an example of something that sort of petered out and you know, uh, yeah. is, is basically not really used anymore. Um, Elm seems to have sort of like found a solid niche. There's just like a chunk of people who are like, yes, this is how I want to do front-end development. Mm. But it's not, it doesn't seem like it's it's on track to take over the world. It mm. seems like it's it's on track to be, well, it already is like a self-sustaining thing and it, and it seems like it's on track to sustain. Um, so that's something that we've seen with a lot of backend languages. There are plenty of backend languages that are not like, take, no language is taking over the whole backend. It's that just way. like, People have preferences on the back end world, um, whereas on the front end, it's it's very much been like, you know, uh, you can you can use any programming language you want as long as it's a JavaScript dialect. <laughs> like it can be JavaScript or it can be TypeScript or it can be CoffeeScript, all of which have the tagline "It's just JavaScript," or implicitly in the case of JS itself. Um, and then all of the other ones have mm. have been really like kind of niche players. But if you think about it, I mean, like on the back end, it's really common to have a language that has like, you know, low market share, but is like quite a healthy, active community mm. with lots of people in it. Um, it's just on the front end, that's like a weird thing to be. Mm. And Elm mm. being a front end focused language, um, I, I just never guessed that. I, I thought it was like, oh, it's either going to take over or it's or it's going to peter out. I didn't expect it to become more like a back end language and that it's just, yeah, there's a chunk of people who like to like do it this way and it's fine. Uh, it's, it's, you mentioned TypeScript, so yeah. that's the um, elephant in the room in some ways, right? <laughs> so what, 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 do you, what would you ascribe to, what, can you see sort of any particular reasons that TypeScript has sort of eaten the world or there's some discussion about it at the moment, uh, but yes. um, you know, in comparison, because I mean, they're both on the surface, surface, yeah, fairly similar ideas, really. Uh, Elm and TypeScript, or uh, or 
Well, with two things. Well, so um, essentially taking taking something that's going to be um, implement, able to be used in the in the browser, but offers maybe a, a safer, m- uh, allegedly sure. more productive uh, perspective on programming front end. So. Yeah. So I, I think like when I think about um, comparing Elm to JavaScript and TypeScript to JavaScript, and I guess also TypeScript to Elm, um, like TypeScript and JavaScript. I mean, TypeScript is really like this is going to feel like JavaScript, but with types. Mm. Elm is like. I am a programming language and I run in the browser. Mm. It really has no relation to JavaScript other than like as a compilation target. So mm. actually you mentioned like Clojure earlier. I would liken Elm to Clojure except uh, like even even more separated from the hosts. Like Clojure is very much like I'm a programming language, but I intentionally have some Java-like elements inside, mm. but I don't think anyone who's written Clojure and would ri- has written Java would say like, oh, this is a Java dialect, I, you know? Yeah. Um, but they, they do like share data structures and things, whereas Elm, it's even less than that. It's really just kind of like, well, we use the same like string representation under the hood and stuff like that, but that's that's kind of about it. It's really like this feels like a totally different programming language, whereas TypeScript feels like this is a new take on JavaScript. I would say, um, and I guess that's maybe that's a good comparison. I think with Clojure as well, because if you look at something like a like two different JVM languages, like Clojure yeah. and Scala, say, I mean, most people's entry point into Scala was programming Java without yeah. semicolons. That was the old joke, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and w- whereas Clojure is a f- fundamentally different totally. paradigm, yeah. fundamentally different way of approaching writing code. That's a good point. Yeah, I've, I've talked to people in the Scala community who who talk about there being sort of three different ways people do mm. Scala. So one is like Java plus plus mm. or Java without semicolons maybe. Another is I want a hybrid OOFP language. Mm. I want a language that has a lot of OO support and a lot of FP support and I'm going to use them together and I can't get that from Java. So Scala is the way to go. And then the third group is I want Haskell but my boss won't let me use it so I'm going to use Scala as my Haskell standard. Yeah, 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 <laughs> and that's uh, also a popular way of using it. Um, but I don't. I don't see the same thing in Clojure or in Elm. Mm. It's like pretty much. It's like no. Nobody's using Clojure as like lispy Java. Mm. Uh, everyone's using it as like Clojure. <laughs> the same thing in Elm. Maybe a bit random, but when Google first sort of well, publishes the wrong word, but created and then started talking about Dart, yeah, the programming language. Um, we actually had that in. The, we have a thing called the ThoughtWorks Technology Radar, which we you know, every six months we sort of take new stuff and sort of think about it and you know, assign it a. Uh, like an assess or trial or hold. Yeah. Or whatever. And actually, at the time, we sort of said uh, we put Dart on hold yeah. um, on the basis that um, we were super worried that the you know, adoption was going to be limited by the fact that other browsers weren't going to be able to, you know, weren't going to jump on board, mm. right? Because it was a With very the VM much a part of it. The VM part yeah, of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, that's now come back, right? I mean, it shows what we knew. Like <laughs> <laughs> some years later, we now have Flutter, which is kind of you know very much um, being adopted quite quite rapidly at the moment. Yeah. Actually, um, I, I kind of find that find that kind of interesting. Where you've got you've got something that sort of at one point in time wasn't actually you know what had, wasn't really the right time for it to for it to be uh, ad- adopted but then later on it suddenly is the right time well I, I think i think that's uh, that's a great story that that's really one of the i mean um dart to me fits the same category of adoption as ruby mm. where it existed for quite a while like ruby was just big in japan for a while um ruby was created to be like let's make a language i mean matt's was like i want to make a language that's fun mm. to program that was the that was the word he used um i mean dart as i understand it was created basically because of the vm because mm. lars bach you know had done v8 and was frustrated by how difficult it was mm. to do certain optimizations around javascript and he was thinking if we just had a a different language that felt a lot like javascript but which was different in certain very specific ways, we could make a much more efficient VM uh, uh, implementation out of it. Um, and that was kind of the motivation behind creating Dart. And you know, if you think about it, why would people want to adopt that unless you're a VM author? Like it's like, okay, but I'm I'm over here doing my web development job. What's what's the pitch to me? I don't I don't you know care about how easy it is to optimize the VM or how optimized it can be. Um, I just especially since you know, you and your team, Lars, did such a good job yes, making VM right. a lot faster, or V8 a lot faster. Thank you, Eric, as well. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so you know, like, what's in it for me to, to mm. switch from JavaScript or CoffeeScript, which was big at the time, to mm. Dart? Mm. Um, but then the answer comes with Flutter. Mm. And again, you could make the point, Flutter didn't have to be implemented in mm. Dart, but it was. Mm. Same way the Rails didn't have to be implemented in Ruby, but it was. Um, and that, I mean, if you look at, like, what percentage of Dart usage in industry is not Flutter? Mm. I would guess it's 
very small. Yeah, like, right. yeah. um, similarly to, to Ruby and Rails. I mean, it's like overwhelmingly Rails, it's overwhelmingly Flutter. So this is, I the term I use for this is like, this is like the killer app adoption explanation mm-hmm. is like, there's some application of the language that's so popular that it just brings the language's popularity along for the ride mm-hmm. because people want to use that thing and that thing is implemented in that language and they want it so bad they'll use whatever language it happens to be implemented in. That's actually a, quite a nice um, segue for me to go to talk to want to talk a little bit about Rust, maybe? Okay. Because you mentioned about your, the new, new, your new language, Rock, that you're writing. Yes. And we'll come on to that in a, maybe in a sure, minute. Sure, sure, yeah. But the, <laughs> you mentioned about the fact that the compiler is written in, written in Rust, and that's another... I mean, I think, well, we are starting to see, in terms of ThoughtWorks and our clients, adoption in very specific areas yeah. for Rust. Um, specifically, there's lots of interest, for example, in automotive or you know, so, uh, sort of safety-critical systems and these kinds of things. Uh-huh. Um, what made you choose Rust yourself? Ah, so uh, this is a little bit of. I'm going to pr- bring a little of my talk in, into this oh, that's cool. <laughs> conversation. Yeah. But, this will be published um, a lot later. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> It'll be fine. So, uh, so basically, I uh, really, really, it's really, really important to me that the Rock compiler be very, mm. very fast. Mm. Um, I really want it to run as fast as possible, and I, I certainly did not want to get to a point where I would built this whole compiler out. Um, I say me because that's what I was thinking at the time. Now it's a bunch of people working on it, <laughs> and, and a lot of them are better at this stuff than I am. But um, you know, I didn't want to end up with a compiler that was very feature complete and very done. And then we're like, and we can't really eke any more performance out of it because of the language we've chosen yeah. that is like garbage collected and whatnot. And there's just this ceiling we cannot possibly exceed, no matter how many hours of performance we put into it, unless we rewrite it in like a Rust or a C or C plus plus or something. And I really thought I don't want that to happen. I want this to be as fast as it can be, mm. and I don't want to hit that ceiling. So um, that meant one of a couple different options. One was do C or C++, which I'd had some really bad experiences with earlier in my life around like uh, getting memory unsafety related bugs that were really, really painful yeah. to track down. Um, and I basically was like, well, the pitch of Rust is that you have the maximum memory ceiling, mm. but somehow, and I didn't really know how at the time, um, somehow they do compiler things to help you not run into those problems. And so I thought, well, that seems like kind of the only game in town that fits all my criteria. There's no performance ceiling, and uh, and yet I'm not going to get these memory and safety bugs that are a, a nightmare to track down. So uh, I kind of took the plunge, and um, I, I'd, done, I'd done a little like toy thing in Rust, or I'd built a little command line app uh, that I'd never quite finished before. So I had a feeling for the language, and I was like, okay, I can... I can get this, uh, I can stumble through it, and now I feel very comfortable in Rust, but when I started out, it was like, just because I had this list of criteria, and that was the one language that, 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 <laughs> that popped out, right? Yeah. And you got to choose as well, which is a, yeah, the yeah. nice thing, right? I yes, yeah, very yeah. important, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I remember my colleague, Eric Dunenberg, um, he's based, based in Germany, he's our head of tech at the moment in Germany, and he, re- he did a really great talk on at one of these events on Rust. Um, and it was back at the time when not that many people were adopting it. So it was quite early on. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, there's a bit of an overview and why Rust and, again, actually why some of the other languages that have started, started to appear around, which, you know, like Go and, um, oh, God, I always forget the Apple one. Swift, is it? Yeah, Swift. Uh, and why they, you know, what, what, what problems they were attempting to to solve, you know, yeah. which is around memory safety. It's something like, I can't remember the exact number, but some very high proportion of bugs. 70% Microsoft of CEs, did, uh, yeah. Right? So, yeah. yeah, I mean, this this was 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 around that. But he did, he did this lovely little thing at the end of it where I think he, he didn't, it wasn't Conway's, it wasn't Game of Life, but it was a similar kind of um, agent-based kind of um, uh, implementation. He, he always uses that. Uh-huh. When he's learning a new language, right? You yeah. need to, you need something, you know. You need some framework to understand when, when you're learning a new a new language. Um, and he started running it, and he was, he was sort of running multiple iterations of it. And he was looking at the performance. He was like getting really. He was like, this this is actually a lot lot faster than the. I think it was a JavaScript implementation, ridiculously you know, faster, orders of magnitude faster. Um, but he thought, actually, I thought it'd be better than this. <laughs> and he realized he hadn't turned off, and I'm not going to get this wrong. But he hadn't turned off the. Uh, there's some kind of like um, setting in Rust, I think, which you can turn off. It's like production mode versus. Does oh that make yeah, sense? yeah. This is an optimization flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. You, and he'd forgotten to use that, and then suddenly yeah. it was like three orders of four <laughs> orders of magnitude <laughs> faster. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quite like as an idea. Yeah, yeah. That sounds about right. <laughs> I mean, that flag makes a big difference. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you, I mean? How did you go? How did, okay, maybe let's generalize it. There's Rust in particular. Yeah. But which is spiky, I'm told. I've only like read some books. I've not really done any um, serious attempt to, to learn it. Um, but I'm, I'm informed it's quite spiky. There's quite a quite a adoption curve. Um, how do you go about adopting or 
learning new languages? Yeah. Or so, do you know enough now that you, you just know, go, oh, it's that sort of thing? Well, it's funny because you mentioned like, um, I, I know a lot of people who like to do the same, like I'm going to learn a new language, I'm going to pick a project like Game of Life that I'm very familiar mm -hmm. with and implement that in the new language. I'm almost the opposite where I always need uh, to, to have some specific project in mind first, right. where I'm like, I want to build this in this language uh, or, or this whatever the new technology is. Um, and then that motivates me to push through whatever the learning curve is because I'm like, well, I, I can't get it any other way, so I got to do it. Um, whereas, uh, so I, I guess maybe I don't tend to just seek out to learn languages just mm. for the sake of learning mm. them. It's more like um, there's some problem I want to solve. This seems like the right tool. All right, let's go. Uh, so I don't think I've ever done the... And obviously picking the easy easy things, right? Uh, right. <laughs> just write a compiler. Well, just... uh, yeah, right, yeah, I'll just write a compiler, which I'd never done before either. Um, but I, I guess, uh, I don't know, at least for me, the hard part of learning something new is is generally sort of finding the motivation to, to climb over these obstacles that I hit, whatever they might be. Um, and I also am aware of, uh, there's definitely an element of, if you pick a project that's too hard and a language that's too hard, and you know, like those, those can kind of compound for sure. Um, but I had previously done this little command line app in Rust, where, where actually the motivation there was um, it was the the Elm test uh, test runner, and now there actually is somebody else uh, separately went off and like and, and did a different um, uh, Elm test runner implementation in Rust. Uh, but at that point, it was actually mostly just frustration with Node.js APIs, <laughs> which is what the 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 one I, I'd written um, previously was in. And I one day not, not was just, because Node is blazingly fast. Uh, no, not, not, it was nothing to do with performance. It was really just like I was like, I want to write this in something that has a different set of APIs, shall we say? Um, and I didn't really want to use Go because I didn't have any particular interest in Go. And I was like, well, I want to learn Rust, and I want I want to have a code base that I can maintain that's not Node.js mm -hmm. anymore. So ah, I'm just going to rage rewrite it in Rust. And I got like seventy percent of the way through that, and I was like, okay, I I, I have a feel for this language mm -hmm. now, and I you know feels uh. Not, I'm not great at it, but I, I, I at least uh, can stumble my way through doing things. Um, and I have this code base. Then, as happens with many projects that are around the 70% mark, I was sort of like, okay, yeah, but do I really want to do the rest of the work yeah. to, to get this over the finish line and then maintain that code base and then new contributors are not going to know what they're doing and so on and so forth. So I ended up kind of putting it on the shelf and not finishing it. But somebody else separately went and, and did it. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, I definitely would agree with um, the, the, the learning curve on Rust is definitely a downside. Mm. It's, it's quite high and it's also, it's not, um, like some languages I think have a high learning curve because like, like Haskell, for example, um, Haskell, I, I would say has a high learning curve in part because a lot of the things, uh, are you're encountering for the, the first time. Mm. Like, yeah, I've never heard of these concepts before. I don't know what, what they're about. And there's just kind of a lot of stuff to learn. Um, in Rust, I would say the thing that's the hardest about the learning curve, and people often talk about fighting the borrow checker. Mm. Um, so the borrow checker is kind of Rust's like marquee feature. It's what sets yeah. it apart from other languages. It's what gives you the memory safety. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's not so much like you can just sit down and like once you wrap your head around the borrow checker, you got it and it clicks. Um, it's more like there's just a whole lot of things like, uh, that, that all fall under the, the umbrella of borrow checker, but they're various different scenarios. Mm. And I remember one time, I, it took me, I'm embarrassed to say, like, I think it was like, like two months or something where I couldn't figure out how I, this part of the compiler was blocked and I couldn't figure out how to do the thing I wanted to do. And, you know, Borrow Checker gave me an error, said, like, you can't do this. And I was like, but why not? I know, I know this is possible. Yeah, if this were yeah. in like C or something, I, I would just be like, here, take this thing and put it over there, yes. put it on this thread. And I was like, no, you can't do that. And I was like, but why not? Why, why can't I do that? And I eventually realized, I was like, wait a minute, do I just need to use. It was uh, iter mut versus iter, and what iter the difference is um, iterating over these iter is like I want to iterate through yeah. these things, and iter mut is I want to iterate with the possibility of mutating them. Yeah. But it didn't occur to me to use iter mut because I didn't want to mutate them at all. But the problem was I needed to use iter mut in order to prove to the borrow checker that I had permission to mutate it, which meant that it was safe to put it on a thread. So in this case, mutable was sort of a stand-in for is uniquely owned by this particular instance. And I switched it to iter and iter mutt, and this thing that I've been stuck on for like two months, it was like, okay, right? And uh, I would love I, to be in the room at the right? time. It was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I bring this up to, as an analogy of like, you know, even though I had that, I already knew the mental model of mm. like, you know, mutable means is uniquely owned mm. and therefore has permission to do certain things. It hadn't occurred to me that, I, I didn't like put two and two together with yeah. the implications of that, that like, oh, if I want to, 
put these things on threads, I need to iter mutt, even though I'm not going to mutate yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's just a lot of stuff. It's like almost that. like you've been more restrictive than you need to in some senses, right? You, you, because the mental model is okay. I need this is a really restrictive yeah, uh, memory well, model, so I need so I want to be overly restrictive. And, and I in think in, in this case, um, it was more of a, a, a language terminology thing in the okay. sense that I think if if instead of calling it iter mutt, they called it you know iter unique. Um, I'm not saying that was the they, they should rename it. I'm, it's more just like if they called it that, I think I would have more quickly realized like, oh yeah, I need to mm. in order to hand these things out to the threads, they have to be unique because the whole point is I, I don't want them to be shared across the threads. Um, that's like another aspect of Rust that makes it tricky is that part of what the borrow checker does has to do with uh, when things are like uh, available in memory, um, like mm. when they're in, in the lifetimes of like when they're alive and when they're uh, you know can be reclaimed um also about mutation access like this thing can or cannot mutate it also multi-threading and like which things have permission to mutate things which has to do with like preventing data races in mm -hmm. addition to um memory safety so there's just a lot of different things that all kind of come together and uh and, and put it all together you get a big learning curve <laughs> so so I mean, you see, you've obviously you, you spent a lot of time building this compiler yeah. clearly um because the two months were <laughs> um <laughs> But the aim of it, presumably, is to compile this new language. So yes. maybe you can talk a bit about 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 Rock. And yeah, sure. That um, unique and why 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 you decided to uh, a new language? Yeah, so so Rock. The tagline is uh, fast, friendly, functional. And uh, I, I was just talking to Dave Thomas, and he mentioned that he uh, he knows someone who made another language. I think it was was it K maybe? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Which yeah. uh, the tagline was fast, fun, functional, which I did not know existed, uh, but it's very, very close to what I independently came up with. Um, but the basic idea is I, I really wanted a language that um, felt like Elm in terms of uh, the ergonomics and the overall user experience, but which is for, uh, instead of being focused on browser-based UIs, which is sort of Elm's bread and butter, um, I wanted it for sort of, not just like one other domain, but sort of like the long tail of domains. So. Right. Um, I'm not just thinking about like servers and command line apps, although those are the two things that people are most interested in it for, um, or, or desktop GUI applications, which I'm also interested in. Um, but also things like, uh, <laughs> well, if you can replace Electron, the world will be a happier place. So, so, anyway, so, <laughs> well, that's, so. I mean, it's, that's, that's a very big <laughs> challenge, right? It's, it's not an easy thing. There's a reason Electron is so popular. Um, but, uh, but definitely, uh, I, I've always run into these little cases where it would be, um, and VimScript is going to be the one that comes first to mind. Like, I want to write a Vim plugin. Uh, I don't want to learn VimScript. Mm. I don't want to use VimScript. I've heard, you know, it doesn't have a good reputation as a language. Um, uh, but what I want to use is I want to have, like, an Elm-like experience, this, this, uh, this really pleasant experience I'd had with Elm. Um, but, but Elm being a focused language is not ever going to get into that. Yeah. There's never going to be an Elm for VimScript. Um, so I wanted to make a language that was capable of being used in lots of different domains while still feeling like it was, to some extent, domain focused, mm. um, like how Elm is. Um, so without getting too much into how, how we achieve that, um, there's, there's this basic high level concept of uh, platforms and applications. So what we mean by that, an application is basically just like, you know, my project, I'm building a thing. Um, yeah. A platform is something like a framework. Uh, in the sense that it's sort of the foundation that you build on. You never have more than one platform, you always have one. Um, but unlike most languages in Rock, you have to pick a platform. There's no such thing as like a platformless Rock application or like a you know frameworkless, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is that platforms, although they kind of feel like frameworks, they're scoped differently. So a framework typically, um, like let's use Rails for example, yeah. Rails will be in charge of things like database access and how do you do uh, routing and like request handling and, and stuff like that. Um, in Rock, sure, that would be true too, but also uh, it's going to be in charge of all of your low-level I.O. primitives. Mm. So it's going to say, here is all the things you can do in terms of HTTP and you know database access and this and that. Um, and for a web server, maybe you have like uh, the full range, but you probably don't have like reading from standard in. Uh, on a web server. Does that okay. really make sense? Yeah, yeah, Maybe does, you leave yeah, that one out. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, a better example, though, is let's say that you want to make a platform for like a database extension. Well, now you're, you're running like a Postgres extension. Do you even want to have like network access? Right. Do you want to have arbitrary file system access? Does that make sense? Um, so the way most languages do this is like the standard library has all these really low level IO primitives. And then there's certain use cases where it's like, eh, don't, don't do that. Don't, yeah. don't, don't uh, write to that. But a problem this creates in the ecosystem for these sort of long tail of use cases is that you use a library and that library is like, oh, I can just like create a tempter and put stuff in there, right? And it's like, I don't know if I want you doing that on my database server, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and so the idea is that by basically making it so that you have to pick a platform, the platform says which primitives are available, 
you can, the, the ecosystem will sort of naturally design itself to be accommodating to that and to be aware hmm. of that and to be like, oh, if I choose to, you know, use a tempter or whatever, um, that's going to restrict which platforms I can potentially run on. If I, if I read from standard in, that's going to restrict which platforms I can run on. Um, another thing is that the platforms, because they're in charge of the IO primitives, um, they can implement certain like sandboxing features. Hmm. So one example of something that I'd be, I personally hope someone builds in Rock because they now can, um, which I would love to use is a sort of a sandbox script runner. So for example, like this is uh, something that Dino has at the language level, but in Rock you can just, anyone can implement it in user space, which is basically like, you know, if I download a script from the internet yeah. and I run it, I know it might mess up my machine. Like it might give me a virus. It might write to, you know, places on my disk that I didn't want it to write to. But because in Rock you have uh, this, this platform application split, if I have an, a platform that's like, I'm a command line runner, but I'm a sandbox command line runner. Mm. And because I'm in charge of every single one of the IO primitives, I can say, yeah, look, I give you all access to all the IO primitives, but guess what? If you try to write to this part of the file system or you try to read from there, I'm going to prompt the user and there's nothing you can do about it. So yeah. it's, it's now as safe as a web browser in terms yeah, of, super interesting, you know, yeah, yeah but, but, but at the command line. And I would love to have that because mm. I run stuff that I download from the internet all the time and I'm either doing it in a VM. You hear it here right? yeah, first, folks. <laughs> or she's running stuff he downloads. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we all do, right? <laughs> um, and I would love to have something where I just had this confidence that I don't need to audit the whole thing. I just need to look what platform you're using. Okay, it's a sandbox one. Great, done. I think this is a really interesting idea because, I mean, I've only sort of come across this maybe a couple of times before, but I, like, I, it seems to have people aren't really talking about it. It seems. No, but five years ago, there were lots of people talking about unikernels for a different mm, reason. This, yeah. this was about security and about the kind of, you know, um, the different, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the surface, the attack surface area, essentially. Yeah. Right? Can we limit, um, limit the amount of stuff we're going to compile into our OS so that it's not available? You can't even use any of it. Right. It's just not there. Um, and I think, you know, I had a, had a line at one point that like, Docker 30% of the way to unikernels was like, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, that was five years ago. Um, it's not really talking about it, but it seems like a, in some ways a similar idea, but coming at it from a different perspective. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely about. I mean, I, think, I would say the thing that you have in common there is the idea of security through just like absolutely not making things available in the yeah. first place, rather than having them be available and trying to make sure you played whack a mole and knocked <laughs> locked everything down. Right, yeah. just saying like it's not even there by default, and we are only going to opt into giving you access to the the, mm. the minimal set of things necessary to do whatever you need to do. Cool. And and what sort of language is it? Is it is it a purely functional language? Yeah. You said it's functional. Yeah. It's right. It's it's functional, and and I would say um like like Elm, uh, there's a very heavy focus on usability and user friendliness and stuff like that. Um, so uh, it's it's I mean there's different sort of schools of thought of like functional programming languages. Yeah. So I would say that like uh, like Haskell is very focused on like mathematics mm -hmm. or at least like it culturally feels that way. Um, you know maybe different people would would. Uh, disagree with that but um and i would say like you know, closure is a, is a very like you know it's all about lisp and like yeah. macros and like these particular set of primitives that are not necessarily required for functional programming but um like fit together in interesting ways with functional programming um and like elm and rock are very much like typed pure functional very uh focused on like having a small set of simple language primitives that work well together and then really nice compiler error messages and ergonomics and stuff like that mm. um so we do stuff like and, and also I, I would say we're um, on the tooling side, we're drawing a lot of inspiration from Go, mm. where we're like, we have the test runner built in, we have the formatter built right, in. We right, just right, right. we want to make it so you know you download the rock binary and then you can just go. You don't yeah. need to you know pick pick a bunch of things off the shelf you know to um, get things that everybody agrees you should have a testing system, <laughs> um, but you don't need to go pick one off the shelf. It's just like it's there, it's right there, built in. And have you have you, have you taken the same talking of, of Go? I mean, have you taken the same decisions around things like? Testing with, or is it Rust? You with Rust, you test inline. Do you have the tests in the same files? You can do that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. yeah. So we do have inline tests. Mm -hmm. uh, you just, it's the keyword is called expect. So you can yeah. just like write your function right below it, next line, expect whatever, and then, and then you're done. Ah, super cool. Um, actually, I, I guess a, a nice example of ergonomics. Um, this is always something I'd liked. Uh, Power Assert is the one that comes to mind that mm -hmm. I I'd use. And I also, um, back in the day, I did a little bit of uh, um, development with uh, Groovy. And uh, they had that built into their tester. And I always thought it was cool is that basically, uh, when you run your tests in Rock, uh, you can just write normal Booleans. Like you don't need to do like exert, assert this or that. You just say like, you know, expect X equal, or, you know, foo X equals five and that's it. Um, and what it'll do is uh, if, if that test fails, is it'll um, 
so first of all, we'll print out the source code of the actual test that you wrote. And then also any named variables that you had, it'll just tell you what their values were. Yeah, like, cool. So you don't have yeah. to go back and be like, oh wait, what was this? And just trying to give you, and we've also talked about maybe expanding that a little bit to tell you like what's on either side of the equals or if you did like a less than, you know, show you those things because you might want to know. Basically just try to give you the info that you want anyway and don't make you go back and like, you know, debug log the, the, <laughs> the test. Yes, which, yeah. You know, yeah. That's the first thing you usually do anyway. Right? Yeah, well, so, yeah. So might as well save you the trouble. Yeah. Yeah, I was always of the opinion when I, when I, I'm, I don't write so much, as much code as I used to anymore, uh -huh. has to be said. Um, but I was always of the opinion if you use the debugger, you're, you're, you're failing somehow. But it, it was a, a, <laughs> I come from a very sort of um, purist, purist TDD kind of uh, background, if you like. So, um, well, but but, regressions still happen. Yeah, right? of course. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. Yeah. 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 Ah, cool. So, I mean, uh, um, so are you seeing, so is it out? Is Rock out now? Uh, it's, I would say it's pre-release, so we don't, we, we don't have a numbered version yet. You can download a nightly release. Um, we're we're uh, in the process of uh, making a real website right now. Depending on when you watch this, maybe it'll be out. Uh, yeah. But um, right, right now, like as of this exact moment, there's like kind of a placeholder website that sort of describes yeah. the language, but it's, it's very bare bones. Um, but <clears throat> now we've gotten to the point where it's uh, it's actually useful for things. So prior to this point, like like last year, I would say like, well, you can try it out and play around with it, but mm -hmm. it's not you know uh, really that useful. But now it actually is useful. Mm -hmm. I would say it's useful, but very immature and early, and definitely there's bugs and stuff like that. But um, but you can like build stuff with it for real now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now that we're at that point, we're like, okay, now we need like a real website, and yeah. you know, uh, so it's it's ready to uh, be used by early adopters who aren't afraid to, to sort of roll up their sleeves with the new technology. Um, but I actually, like, um, I have a lot of fine, fondness for my time at the beginning of Elm because, on the one hand, when you have a small set of people using the technology. Um, Yes, there's there's sharp edges and bugs and stuff and things aren't the ecosystem's not there yet. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, um, you know, I, I I used to work with uh, Bill Venners who made uh, Scala tests, mm. and I remember thinking uh, like how how could you have made something that's used by so many people? And I asked him about that. And he's like, oh, it's very easy. Back then there was no testing thing, so I made one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it is in the early yeah. stages of a language. Somebody's got to yeah. be the first person to write whatever X is for that yeah. particular uh, you know use case. My programming career goes back through you know before Java essentially mm -hmm. um, and that sort of completely changed my life right so when yeah. Java came out with and the internet essentially or the world wide web um, and uh, and Java really sort of changed pretty much the way I think most many programmers went about their job yeah um, but the interesting thing with that especially in ThoughtWorks is everything was a first mm. you know everything you were doing was a first in a lot of ways the kind yeah. of the testing frameworks were, were a first the Continuous integration servers were first. Mm -hmm. The you know the, the 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 you know well the yeah the acceptance testing frameworks like Selenium and these they were a first. All these sort of things were um, the innovations that were happening were because people were facing were hitting these issues and then kind of trying to come up with a way of solving a a, a problem that they were experiencing on a day to day basis. And I do sort of wonder now: are we still seeing are, are we still seeing that, or all these sort of solved problems now? It's just when we have a new thing, new language say like rock yeah. we need to create the test runner for them you know, and there's someone who's going to be the first person to do that there's someone who's going to be the first person to do x rather than it being or another example would be things like machine learning you know uh, applying engineering discipline to machine learning so you know there was there was a period not so long ago where the idea that you might version control your model was like a crazy idea. <laughs> yeah, why would you yeah. why would you think about it? But that's now a kind of normal thing. So things are repeatable and so on. Um, it, 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 is this a case of sort of we're applying, I guess, a set of tested and known patterns to to the new things? Is that a kind of? I, I'd say it's a mix. Um, <clears throat> so an example that comes to mind is uh, so in Rock we we have an, uh, a, as far as I know unique. I don't know of any other language that does it this way. Approach to uh, serialization and deserialization. So uh, two different ways that this is like commonly done today. So there's like the JavaScript way and uh, the Ruby way where you you get some JSON in mm -hmm. and you just say like JSON dot parse and it's like cool. Now you have a JavaScript object. And of course the downside of this is. Uh, you know, you get part way cool, through your program. Yeah, JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, and then like, well, you know, what if the JSON doesn't match what you thought it was going to match? Um, you're going to find out about that eventually, mm -hmm. but it might be pretty distant from where that original problem happened. Um, so that's one way of doing things. Another way of doing things is uh, let's. I'm thinking of Rust, but I mean, I know in Java you can do it the same way, where you basically have a schema up front, mm -hmm. and you say, uh, so this would be like Jackson in, yep. in Java. Um, so you say, here is exactly what I expect it to look like. And uh, and you know come in parse the JSON and if it doesn't match that fail right away right there, um, 
So that, in terms of uh, you know how easy it is to debug later, I would say that's easier to debug mm-hmm. later. Um, but a downside of that is that you do need to actually write out the whole schema and you know sort of keep it in sync with your program mm-hmm. and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, so something we've introduced in Rock that I, as far as I know, is novel um, is that we kind of have uh, both. So you can write um, at the same time. So you write uh, the equivalent of like JSON.parse, um, and uh, and it does just you know you don't have to write a schema, but what it does is it uses type inference to infer the type that you're parsing into and based on how it's used in the rest of the program. And so it actually will decode it right there at the call site. And if it doesn't match how you're going to be using it throughout the rest of the program, it fails right away. That's super um, interesting. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> now, what's interesting about that is that that's not specific to JSON. It's uh, it's something that's just like, we call it you know decoding is the, is the general term for it. Um, so in order to make it work for, let's say, JSON, somebody needs to write a particular like JSON aware parser that works with this framework mm-hmm. so that uh, it can you know translate between JSON and, and uh, rock values. Um, so on the one hand, you could look at that and say, well, this is just somebody needs to write a JSON parser for yeah. rock. But on the other hand, structurally, it's different from how it's done in other languages. It's not like you're just translating it into a, like a, a normal um, think, is, is there JavaScript a TypeScript logic called IOTS or something like that? I've heard of this, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I believe that that things. works like it works in Java and uh, and like Elm and Rust, where where you you do make a schema and you know somehow you define in code, like you write some code mm. that you know does this. Um, I, I assume mm. I don't know for sure, but I assume that. Uh, you either write it by hand, or there's like a, you run a some some code that generates it, or something like that. Um, but as far as I know, in TypeScript, it's either you do that, or else um, you just say JSON dot parse, and you know it's that part's just not type checked. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but uh, yeah, but the point being, like you know, if if you're writing this, it's like you're doing it in a different way than has been done before. Uh, but on the other hand, it is still just you know for JSON, for XML, for CSV, whatever. Um, it's uh, it's good. We're talking about functional programming languages, and we finally got to the point where something's a bit monad-like, <laughs> <laughs> which is good, right? Um, because that is interesting, right? Like, so that's why I found it interesting about TypeScript and. Um, you pass this stuff over the wire, uh, and you've got all this. You've got this lovely t- sort of type safety within the environment you're working in, which yeah. is the, the the front end. But as you say, like you could be that be, could be sent garbage that is essentially you've got no way of knowing until right. you try and parse it, decode it, whatever. So I kind of like the idea that actually there's 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 a, maybe an attempt to solve some of those problems. We're actually being type type safe across the entire. Uh, I guess back front end, etc. Yeah, um, and across the wire. And one one thing I do, oh, I, I did a lot of integration, a uh, lot of of lot of XML parsing in my day. Yeah, uh, um, and what, yeah, we used to use XML. Um, we used to, oh, what's it called? XPath. That was the thing. Oh yeah. Um, where yeah, rather really. you know rather than rather than do the kind of like take the schema, basically have a have a client that's generated from the schema, and you you kind of you know you, when you receive. Uh, a message you, you turn that into the object, and if, if it doesn't match the schema, you blow up. You'd say instead of that, you'd use XPath to just pick out and Schematron actually was with the thing. You yeah. pick out just the bits from the message that you wanted, and then therefore you would know if you, you were insulated from changes to the schema, if you like. So, um, you know, if someone changed the schema, you weren't suddenly going to blow up. Um, yeah. Because this is the main problem, right? I mean, how do you avoid that that issue of essentially just falling over in a heap if the thing that turns up isn't what you're expecting? So if it doesn't conform to um, yeah, so um, if you can't decode it, right? Do you yeah. just blow up and just like, well, sorry, we're done? <laughs> that's that's oh. well, the default is. I mean, it's not like a throwing exception. It's just yeah. like uh, you you get back a value that says either it succeeded and here's your answer, or uh, it failed and then here's you know the error that, that it failed with, mm-hmm. such as like you know this field was missing or something like that. So uh, recovery is sort of up to you as the application yeah, author. Yeah, it's right. not you know um, I don't think there's a one size fits all way to recover from <laughs> from, oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. from uh, data being missing. Um, Which the, it's the build time versus. It's the compile time versus um, versus runtime checking of these things, right? So that's what we used to do. We used to do it at build time. So we'll we'll, we'll generate a library based off mm. a schema, and then that library is going to be quite fragile in the face of changes elsewhere, um, if you like. And you'd have to rebuild, recompile, recompile your your application if yeah. someone's schema changed somewhere, which is like yeah. suck. Yeah. You know? Now, having said that, if you want to write something that is more flexible at runtime, like you can say, well, it's okay if this field is is missing. I, I want to default to this or that. You can do that, but then at that point, you need to, uh, at least in Rock's case, you would need to sort of, um, I'm going to use the term eject, like <laughs> eject, you know, like tr- translate the automatic thing that's happening into um, uh, like an actual like written out schema, like a decoder that you can then customize. Mm-hmm. So this is how we do it in uh, in Elm is like it's always done that way, mm-hmm. which makes it very easy to customize. Um, another nice thing about that is 
uh, if you have it all written out, that it means that uh, if you want to change your variable names or something like that, you can do that without worrying that you're accidentally causing a regression yeah, yeah, in, yeah, in the yeah. decoding, which you know hopefully a test catches, but it might not. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then again, there's another trade-off there, which is that uh, when you have it all written out, it becomes a little bit more brittle to uh, internal changes. Like, so if I need to like you know add a field somewhere to um, that's that happens to be in a data structure that's used quite often throughout this thing, I have to go through and change it in a bunch of different places. Um, and uh, so, so certain things like being synchronized either can be a source of bugs or can be a source of convenience. And it's just an innate trade-off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you do sort of eject the decoder and, and have it all written out, then, uh, then you can be a lot more flexible in terms of if the runtime value is this or that, or this is missing, but that's not, or uh, you know, I can say, well, I'll accept any of these three names here and I'll just internally convert them to the same thing. Um, so a lot more flexibility if you go that route. I feel like uh, we've gone quite deep into some random part of the language, which yeah. is sort of like parsing, yeah. <laughs> parsing responses. From, um, but let's maybe chunk it up a bit. So what, what are you excited about in terms of features? For Rock? For, for Rock, yeah. Um, yeah, great question. So, uh, I mean, th that is, to be fair, one of, one of the things I'm excited about. Um, so in general, like, uh, it's it's 100% type inference, so you can, you know, uh, you don't need to write any type annotations if you don't want to. Um, uh, I mentioned that, like, you know, it's fast, friendly, functional. So in terms of fast, the thing that I'm excited about, uh, there's two parts to that. One is really fast compile time, mm -hmm. so we spend a lot of time doing that. We still have a number of projects to go, but um, I... Uh, one of the things that, I mean, you mentioned like TDD earlier, one of, one of my hypotheses for why there's a really strong testing culture in uh, Ruby, like for example, um, and, and I, I think in Python also, um, uh, more so than I've seen in like type checked languages. Uh, I think part of the reason for that is that um, you get a really fast feedback loop when you have a dynamic language for two reasons. One is that there's no compile step. Mm. So we want to just make our compiler so fast that you don't notice it. Yeah. Mm. Um, but the other part of that is that from a workflows perspective, if I am writing a test in Ruby, uh, or let's say I've got a bunch of tests and I'm, I'm, I'm refactoring something, all my tests go red yeah. because uh, you know, I've changed this thing. Okay, fine. Well, I can go and fix them one at a time. Uh, I, I can go like change my implementation and fix whatever and, and they go green one at a time. Now, in a type checked language, the norm today is that I make my changes and I get a bunch of type errors and all my tests are not runnable anymore mm. until I fix every single one of the type errors. Yeah. Um, so the whole like make the test green one at a time by fixing implementation details, that workflow is inaccessible until you fix every single one of the type errors. Yeah. But quite often, I don't want to do that. I want to go through and like, you know, the, change the behavior one at a time and make sure that the new behavior actually passes all the tests. Yeah. And then maybe there's still some leftover type errors because I changed the interface, but those are just going through and updating, you know, callers to, yeah. to do yeah. the new thing. Um, in isolation, I still want to just do this thing. Or let's say I'm uh, trying something out because I, I think the new implementation will have better performance or I'm trying something out and I just want to see how it feels to use it. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't want to have to go and fix every single implication of that. So this gets me to another thing that I'm excited about is that we've designed the compiler. It doesn't 100% work this way yet, but we've at least designed it and uh, you know, we'll get to a point where, where this does work this way, where basically the compiler always type checks your code and always tells you about problems, but they don't block you. Hmm. So you can still run, even if it's got type errors or naming errors or whatever. So the idea is that much like a dynamic language, you still have those workflows available. So I want to get that same experience. This is always something I missed when going from dynamic to, to statically type languages, hmm. is that workflow of like, I can always run my tests, no yeah. matter what's going on. And I can see which ones fail. And you know, if they have a type mismatch, fine, that's a failure, failed yeah. test. Yeah. And yeah. But only if that affects that test. If, if the type mismatch is some distant part of the code base, I don't want to see that. I don't 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 block me. Just let me let me run these tests, and I'll come back to that later. Hmm. Um, so that requires sort of building the whole compiler with that in mind. Um, and it's when I say it's not ready yet, it's because like there's stuff that's like has bugs that we need to fix. But um, but really, I, I'm really excited to use yeah. that. Like when I get to a bigger rock code that does base, sound like a really interesting yeah. feature, really cool feature. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I I like both. I mm. like having the workflow where I you know tell me about the type errors up front, and I also like the workflow where I you know sometimes I, I just want to run the thing yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, like yeah, see yeah, what the yeah. answers are. Yeah. Well, I mean, this I mean, it, it's become quite common, or well, certainly. Uh, I quite like using, you know, kind of basically monitoring the file system for changes and running your tests every time there's a file system change. Yeah, which kind of blows that completely out of the water, right? If you if if, if suddenly a type error is going to stop, right? It's like oh, they all fail. Uh, yeah. Everything's gone, yeah. right? Because I just yeah, yeah. zero so, successes, hundred yeah, yeah, percent yeah. failure. Yeah, yeah. 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 thanks. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's, yeah. that's actually really cool. Yeah. So one one more that um, this is in the design stage, but uh, it's again something that we've designed the language around in the platforms and applications, and and also the fast runtime performance is a big part of this, but. Something that I really want to exist in the world, and we're, we're going to make it happen, um, is 
So package ecosystems, I think, are one of the, after like garbage collection, have been like one of the biggest <laughs> like levers for, for making programming like a lot easier and, and making people more productive. Mm. Um, and when you get a package, like I install a new package, I always get uh, the code and then I get the uh, documentation. Um, and then sometimes, occasionally, there might be, if it's like a really popular, widely used package, I might get separately from all that some editor tooling for my particular editor. So you get like a, I think like the React community has done some cool stuff with this. So like I remember like the Redux dev tools. Mm. I know Redux is not like fall out of favor, but I do remember like, oh, people built tooling for that. And like, but it didn't run in people's editors. It ran in the browser. Mm. And I think mm. that was like kind of a hint of like, hey, our packages and stuff, we could be a lot more productive with them if we had tooling for them. Mm. But in a lot of cases, people don't integrate them into editors because it's like, well, what, I'm going to write, you like VS code and this person likes IntelliJ and this yeah. person likes Emacs and this person likes Vim. I'm not going to write, you know, 10 different yeah. implementations of this. Um, and so what ends up happening is that you get zero implementations. People just don't bother doing mm -hmm. it at all. So what we want to do is we want to solve this at like the language level. And my, my specific concrete goal is to make it as easy to write editor tooling as it is to write a function in Rock. Like you mm -hmm. can just write a function and press enter, go down a line and write it, uh, like a piece of editor tooling right there. And that gets distributed with packages. So mm -hmm. it's just part of the language. And when someone implements like the VS Code, you know, Rock extension, um, <clears throat> part of what they do is they implement a way to handle these things because we have sort of a, um, it has to be kind of a simple vocabulary for this. I, I realize that, of course, we want these to be accessible. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you're thinking with accessibility in mind, you already have to have the language for describing these tools be pretty general so that it can either be rendered on the screen or rendered mm -hmm. for a screen reader or something like that. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you can sort of adapt that to whatever primitives, like Vim has different primitives than VS Code, which has different primitives than IntelliJ. But if you're describing the functionality that you want at a sufficiently high level, mm -hmm. the hope is that I can, you know, we talked earlier about like um, uh, exporting uh, JSON, right? Yeah. Or uh, ejecting it, right? Yeah. I would love for the JSON package that I install just to add like something to my context menu where I can just say, hey, see this like, you know, type inference based JSON decoder. I want to just right click on that and say, extract explicit decoder. It's like, here it yeah, is, nice. yeah, right? Yeah. And then that works in Vim and it works in Emacs and it works in this. And it's like, nobody needed to write a, a, a separate plugin for each of those. It's just the rock extension means that when the author of that JSON package shipped, they included that little bit of functionality and now everybody gets that. And if they want to do the customized version, they can do that. It's mm. totally trivial. Mm. Um, that's exactly the type of thing that I think could make the rock ecosystem just do unprecedented things where you have this, yeah. like everybody can not only ship the code, but also these this tooling that's like a, a force multiplier for everybody else. And then everybody's a multiplier for everybody else. That can be a compounding effect that I think would be really powerful. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I'm most excited about with the language. That's I could go cool. on, but that's, no, 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 that's <laughs> very, very cool. I mean, yeah. It reminds me, of, I think there's something called the principle of least surprise, right? The reason mm -hmm. I love certain tooling over other tooling is because it just lets me, I can almost guess like yeah. how, to, how to achieve a particular thing. I only I need to extract the method. I wonder if I do that. Oh, cool, it works. You know? yeah. But I like <laughs> yeah. this, and it's sort of like, um, it, it, tooling that's designed that way, I think is incredibly powerful because it, it, it just, it, as you say, it acts as a force multiplier. So the idea of building that actually into the language tooling, I think that's super interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, maybe, maybe we should ch chunk up again. Um, what else are you excited about that's going on? Uh, in Rock or, or elsewhere? El elsewhere, elsewhere, just in anything. general. Um, maybe maybe one or two things. I'm very excited right now about uh, learning more about performance optimization on mm -hmm. a personal level. So this was something where like when I was in, uh, as you would say, university we, in America, because we always say college for yeah, some reason, uh, uh, even though the, it says university in the title, whatever. I saw, uh, bizarrely, <laughs> I was actually in a college, but it was a university. So it's all good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, who knows? Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what the formal difference is, to be honest. Uh, yeah. We use them kind of interchangeably. <laughs> but but um, I, when I learned about performance optimization there, there was a very heavy focus on asymptotic complexity. And like, you know, as n gets bigger, the number yeah. of elements get bigger, what, is the, you know, what does the behavior look like? Um, and uh, the, the sort of the stated reason was uh, for, for doing all that was, um, well, uh, this is some knowledge you can have that uh, translates across hardware because, you know, different CPUs have different optimizations and yada, yada. And that was sort of hand waved away. And the more that I've gotten into, because like I said, I'm trying to make rocks compiler really fast. Um, the more that I've learned about, okay, but, but actually you want to make it run fast on, you know, particular hardware, like, you know, the modern Apple laptops or, or you know, Intel servers or whatever. Um, it, there's a particular set of like techniques that you use that do need to know about the hardware. Yeah. And there's like, uh, as, as I have more and more come to learn, like 
the stuff that we learned about the asymptotic complexity is really just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to get stuff going fast, it's like now learning about like, you know, CPU memory caches and TLVs and uh, like, you know, <laughs> virtual memory and uh, paging and uh, SIMD. And um, uh, there's there's uh, this great talk by Andrew Kelly who made Zig um, a couple years ago uh, where he talks, it was at uh, Handmade Seattle, I forget what, what year, like 2021 maybe, mm -hmm. something like that. Maybe, maybe it was pre-pandemic, might've been 2019. Um, but he basically talks about how he made Zig's compiler a lot faster. And he's not talking about any of that like asymptotic complexity mm -hmm. stuff. He's talking about like, you know, here's here's the memory management techniques, that, strategies that we used and data oriented design and structure of arrays. And like, we're trying to avoid CPU cache misses. That's the yeah, name of the yeah, game yeah, and yeah. all these things. Um, it's this whole world that I had a, uh, I didn't realize how superficial my understanding of it was. And it's been really exciting to like get into it and be like, wow, I can make things so much faster than I realized. Oh, this, I mean, are you familiar with Martin Thompson's work on this? He talks about the idea of mechanical sympathy. As no, for many years I've now. heard that term, but. Yeah, yeah. Mechanical, mechanical sympathy, which is this idea of being sympathetic to the, to the, to the hardware, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it, what I find fascinating is because we moved away, we, there were, often there were so many levels of abstraction between uh, the yeah. code that you're writing and the hardware that's running on these days, yeah. um, that actually that's sort of, I wouldn't say fallen out of fashion, but people, I, I'm not, I, I don't think people think enough about it, certainly. Um, yeah. But of course, where you want to think about it is in the compiler, right? <laughs> yeah. You don't want to be second guessing that. You know? I mean, the way I think about it is I, uh, something that's been pretty consistent in my career for the last like, I don't know, 10, 20 years has, has been like trying to work backwards from the user experience mm. I want. And for some applications, the performance is not a big concern there. It's just like, well, you're going to be bottlenecked on the database and the database is going to be about as fast as the indices you set up for it. And that's kind of it. Mm. Um, I guess if you wanted to, I mean, now I know enough that I'm like, okay, if you really wanted to, you could roll your own database alternative that's highly optimized for your specific use case. But in a lot of cases, it's like, yeah, but people don't, People don't care about that performance difference. They're like, you know, it's they're going to be waiting for the network anyway. So you're never going to get sub millisecond, you know, or, or and, they, like, and they probably wouldn't pass the Jepson test anyway. So yeah, <laughs> no chance. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, your hand rolled database probably. <laughs> um, but um, but there's a lot of uh, use cases that I can think of where I really do want like performance is part of UX. Yeah. It's and it's a big part. And, uh, and a compiler is absolutely one of them where, um, I mean, I, I like Rust in a lot of ways. I'm, I'm very frustrated by the compile times a lot of the time, um, especially the caching. Like one of, one of, I mean, there's part of it is like how fast is the compiler, but also like which work is it doing? And I, and some, <laughs> on some level, wish almost wish they didn't tell me this, but sometimes I'll be rebuilding my project and I, I just made one little change and it's like, Hey, I'm recompiling your like, you know, JSON crate. And I'm like, what? I didn't do anything. What? Why are you rebuilding that? It's a, nothing has changed, and I'm sure there's some someone can explain to me why it needed to do that. Um, but th there's uh, now that I have more of an appreciation for like, oh, it doesn't have to be this slow. I don't have to be sitting here waiting for this. It's all the more frustrating when the tools I use, you know, whether they're compilers or otherwise, um, are slow, and I know they could be. They, they don't have to be. Well, I, th I think there's another. I mean, I, I think. We'll uh, there's another reason, I think it's quite a serious reason actually these days to think about mechanical sympathy as well as user, user experience is a fantastic example. But I think actually the amount of energy we're using is a super, mm. super important um, consideration now. And if we can be more sympathetic to the hardware we're running on, then potentially we need less of it, right? And that's, that's that that can only be good, I think, <laughs> given yeah. the state of, uh, state of the world at the moment. So. I, I'm, I'm curious about how people measure that because, um, uh, so uh, we have one of the Rock uh, server projects that's uh, in progress right now. Um, uh, the, we got a research grant to do it. This we don't have, probably don't have time to go into all the reasons why it's novel and interesting, but that does like interesting memory management behind the scenes. Um, and uh, and basically, so it, it never has like garbage collection pauses or, or things like that. Um, and there was uh, a researcher who was. Uh, not directly related to the project, but who became interested in it because of the question of, could this mean that you have servers that use less energy? Because, you know, garbage collector, in addition to slowing down your UX, also requires energy to use. And that led, then led to the question was, how do we measure what, right. <laughs> what the difference in energy is? And I, I guess that researcher knows more than I do about that. Um, but it's something I'd never even thought about. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, like, put, put a number on it. What number do you put on it? How do you measure that number? Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 certainly something we've been looking at in Thorwix because it, it's sort of um, there's some interesting design decisions around things like even like how often you build, right? So yeah. you know, we're used to you know, well, hey, we'll commit and build and deploy a thousand times a day. Yeah. Well, that's actually like pushing, like that's that's actually pushing your code through quite quite a few potential stages of a pipeline. Yeah. That's quite a lot of CPU cycles you're doing every time you're doing that. So is this is there some well there will be a function there's there's going to be a function, you probably a UK of uh, optimization where you're going to be looking at like the optimum number of 
deploys per day. Yeah. Um, in order to, you know, when you go over that, you're going to be like using too much, uh, too much or more energy than you need to for the amount of value you're getting from the software. And all this. Anyway, um, I think probably, Richard, we should probably call it a day there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've covered an awful lot. So yeah. thank you so much for coming along and yeah. chatting with us today. It's been brilliant. Thanks for having uh, me. Oh, it's been it's been awesome. It's been really fun. interesting. I'm super excited and looking forward to to checking out Rock. Awesome. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you. This is uh, James and Richard saying goodbye from GoToUnscripted at GoToCopenhagen. Thanks very much. Thanks.